Except me. So not everyone? Who's, who's never used Python before? Sorry. Who knows what a dunker function is? Who doesn't know what a dunker function is? Oh, never mind. <laughs> I read your announcement. You read my announcement. <laughs> Very well. But everyone else knows what they are, so maybe they will be a little disappointed. Um, anyway, so, um, um, so I've done a bunch of talks here over the years. I, I've talked about COBOL a few times. Um, you know, and I talked about punch cards. Um, and I've given a bunch of talks about Perl, too, right? Um, but um, but really, I've programmed in like lots of different languages. So I, I like, sat down and I went through like all the languages I've written code in. I would say like since I started grad school. With what would be in like 2005 through today. So there's Perl 5, right? Is that up there? Um, which I still use all the time. I wrote some actually even at my job um, a couple of years ago. Uh, MATLAB, I did a postdoc where I was using MATLAB pretty much every day for about four years. Uh, C and C are still great. I was using, I was writing C. Uh, a few days ago for one of the advent of code problems. Uh, Python 2 and Python 3. Uh, Java, I taught a course at Drexel, a three semester course in Java for freshmen. Uh, part of my dissertation work was in Java as well. Um, I was trying to learn some Objective-C and some, uh, some Swift for uh, trying to learn how to program apps for this and for my phone. Um, it's doing some R code too. I kind of hate R, but <laughs> lots of people like it. Uh, JavaScript, like everyone uses JavaScript nowadays. We were doing JavaScript and other stuff too. COBOL, I had to write some COBOL in order to get my slides to work for my COBOL talk. Um, I think I did some, I think there was some stuff early in my dissertation which was in uh, Common Lisp, some of the uh, models we had was in the ordinary scheme for a programming languages course. Emacs Lisp, when I was doing the first version of this, and I wanted to load up Emacs in my in a browser window, and it came up with fluorescent green background. Um, so I had to, instead of going over my slides, I spent about half an hour in a Starbucks out in Valley Forge trying to get it to not do that. Um, so, and I don't think that um, unique in this, right? I mean, there's a lot of languages here, but like, we've all like, programmed, even if you think of yourself as like a web developer or a Python program or whatever, right? we all kind of touch lots of languages all the time. And like the, the way we can do this, right, is that there's kind of this core thing of programming, which is more or less the same in all of them. And that's how you kind of can survive. And some of them are a little weird. It's like the lisps are a little weird. R is more weird than other ones, I think. This Python, the, the syntax is a little odd, but um, you can kind of get into this thing. Like, this is terms. Anyone of you ever heard this term hypocognition? I learned this in a podcast a couple of months ago, and I thought it was really interesting. It's the, um, the lack of a linguistic or cognitive representation for an object category or idea. It's this idea that if you don't have a word for it, you don't have the concept in your brain, it's hard even to conceptualize it. Um, one of the people who I think is most well known for this idea is uh, this great American philosopher Donald Rumsfeld, right? And that's his great quote that, um, like, this is his most famous quote, there are known knowns and unknowns and things like this. Um, but so I think this hypocognition falls into this unknown unknowns. Like these things that you don't even know is something that you could, um, that is something you need to be aware of. Um, so, like, with that as a background, so back in the end of April, I started this new job, uh, a company called PsyOps. We do uh, precision medicine. We're trying to help um, oncologists uh, provide better cancer care. Uh, we're hiring, by the way. I have to say this um, for uh, system engineers and uh, data architects and people like that, cloud engineers. Um, so, and they're a Python shop. Um, and so, I had used Python a little bit, but like, that didn't really bother me. I did the advent of code problems last year. I did all the problems all 25 days in Perl and in Python. And so I thought I was doing pretty well, 
pretty, I thought I, I knew Python pretty well. Even by the time I started, I've learned a lot more since then. Um, and you know, it's not really, so, let's see. So, I had been there about a month, and the guy who runs our office saw me in the hallway. He said, so what, like, how's it going? How, how's Python coming along? Because he knew that I didn't know Python all that well when I started. I said, well, you know, it's not really all that different from like Perl and C++ in general. If you know Perl and those languages, you can pick up Python pretty quickly. I don't know if people who have learned Python. I don't know if a lot of people learn it as a first language, but it's really not that hard to pick up, I think. Does everyone kind of agree with me, right? Um, um, and like the thing, I told him the thing I was struggling with is like, we don't just program in Python. Like we have Python and we have Flask, which is this like micro, um, services architecture, and we use something called G-Unicorn, which is, I think, like a Wiz, Wiz G, I don't I even know they, where they, some of these end and other ones begin. We use Swagger and Postgres, and of course, everything's running inside Docker, and of course, Docker, you can't just use Docker, that's inside Kubernetes. Um, and I don't think I'm giving anything away trade secrets. Like, everyone kind of uses something similar to this, right? And, um, and so I think I still struggle with knowing where some of these end and some of them begin. It's like some of them are quite as plugins, and it's hard to know uh, like where the boundaries are between all the whole thing. But like for the most part, they're pretty they're pretty cool, right? They kind of just work, and that's great. But like they're almost too good. Um, and like one problem I was having was like how to debug things because everything's running inside Docker and it's. You can only kind of get to it from a web browser, and so it's not all that great. So things are kind of segmented off in a way that I wasn't quite uh, familiar with. I like this, uh, there's an XKCD for everything, right? And this is kind of talking about that. So I'm about to dive into some code, and before I do that, I added some caveats, and these are from when I gave the talk at FOSCON, and I got a bunch of kind of, uh, I don't want to say annoying, but I got a bunch of questions that were sort of off topic. So, um, so I, before I dive into the code, um, I want to go over this. First of all, the examples I'm going to show are all in Python 3. Um, people kept asking me questions about, well, you can't do that, it's not going to work. And they were used to Python 2, which is a little different. They're pretty similar. I really don't know Python 2 nearly as well as I know Python 3. It's a lot of stuff is simpler. It's nice. If you don't learn, learn some Python 3, it's cool. Um, <coughs> I'm still learning the REPL. I'm going to be in the Python REPL for some of the examples I'm going to go over. Um, I'm sorry, I don't really know it all that well, partly from what I was just saying, that mostly I'm debugging things inside, they're running inside a web browser. So um, I haven't really had a lot of uses to learn the finer points of the REPL. Um, these are mostly aimed at will, actually. All of these comments are aimed at will. Um, <laughs> Who's not even here? Um, he'll watch it on video. He'll watch it on video. Um, so, like, there's probably better ways of doing some of the things um, that I want to show you. But, like, really, it's not talking about the Python data model and not talk about how to debug microservices running inside Docker. Um, and people, I think some people didn't get that idea when I was giving the talk. They kept saying, well, you know, you can do this, you can do this. Like, that's not what the talk is about. So, just call um, all right, so with that as sort of a background, um, I'm going to show an example. So first of all, I have to apologize for the Python people here. I know it's traditional that the examples all have to have Monty Python references, and so I don't have Monty Python references. Um, so this, this is something that came up. I think the actual example was, you know, was, uh, um, what was it, biomarker information or something like that. Or, but it doesn't really matter. So let's say we have a simple, a simple table. Um, and the table just has um, you know, the name of an animal and how many legs it has. I like this example because it's pretty simple. You can, you can whip it up in a couple of minutes. Um, right, so, you know, owl has two legs and a spider has three legs and a starfish has five legs. Yeah, yeah, I know there's starfish that have more than five legs. Whatever. Um, okay, so everyone understands the database, just names and numbers associated with it. All right, 
So we use um, another package which I didn't have in that long list called SQL Alchemy. Is anyone use SQL Alchemy here? Like, just about everyone, right? Um, so SQL Alchemy is pretty nice. Um, coming from a Perl background, it's like a combination of DBI and DBI DBIX class. So you can, if you haven't used it, you can access a database both by giving SQL directly and do queries that way. You can have a whole data model and you can do queries based on the data model of objects without having any SQL at all. And you can go back and forth. It's, it's sort of nice to do that. Um, so here what I'm doing is, I can't reference that very well, that I want to just select the ID, the name, and the number of legs from Apple. So just, I just want to select everything. Um, and so there's a number of different ways to do it, to do that in SQL Alchemy. Um, fetch all is just, I want to select everything and just have it all come out. Um, and then remember, I'm running inside, I'm doing this inside of a web browser. So it's going to get a request, it's going to return it. I just want to print out what it gets. And um, so I'm just going to print out the rows that come back from this. So it's just going to execute the SQL and get all the rows that are and when you do that, you get, what you get back is a list of tuples. Okay, where every one of the tuples is the information on the row that you select. All right? So, what I wanted, wanted to do with this was take this information and turn it into JSON. Uh, and JSON is like a bunch of key value pairs. In fact, the format of it is really similar to what a Python dictionary looks like. And in fact, what I wanted to do was turn that into a dictionary that could take that dictionary and we had tools built into this in that big long stack that I showed you to turn the dictionary into JSON. The problem though is that all I have are just the values, I don't have the keys associated with them. Um, if I were writing this in Perl using DBI, I would have done something like this. Um, in DBI, there's a method called fetch row hash ref, and then when it's a hash, which is what Perl calls dictionaries, you do get the keys and the values, and I could have used that to put it all together. Right? But I don't have that. I just have these, these tuples. And so I was sad. <laughs> um, and I didn't know what else to do, so I wrote this. So I hacked up some Python. And then I got my dictionary out of this. And then I could pass this into our serializer and get JSON out of it. Um, so this is Larry Wall. Uh, he's the guy who created Perl. And he has this quote that Perl programmers are that like a lot, that uh, the virtues of a programmer are laziness, impatience, and hubris. And I say, I was pretty hubris. hubris. I, I struggled saying this in, in first sentence. Okay. Proud. Proud. Uh, I was full of hubris when I wrote this code. Um, because, like, first of all, right, it's got zip in it, right? And I knew about zip. And I had been looking for an excuse to use zip in something. And then I had found it. And not only does it have zip, but not only does it have a list comprehension, it's got a dictionary comprehension in it. And I was just super proud of this code. Like, I thought that I had really leveled up in my like Python ability when I wrote this. And so I did the pull request and at work every time we have some code, we have to get someone else, one of our teammates to approve the pull request before it can go in. Um, and when I, when I submitted this, one of my coworkers said, well, that's really cool, Walt, but why don't you just use dict? <laughs> um, and, okay, so if you look in the, documentation for Python on how to create a dict, it gives you a number of different ways. So you can create an empty dictionary with just dict to the constructor like that. Uh, this is another way of doing, making an empty dict. Um, you can also use keyword arguments like this, which I didn't even know you could do, right? Like you don't even have to put them in quotes or anything, right? So, um, so that was pretty cool. You can pass in, like use the dict, the, the, the dictionary syntax like this, which is probably the most common way of creating them. Um, you can pass in a bunch of tuples of two, 
anything with pairs of things. If you think the first one is the key and the second one is the value, um, you can zip them up like I did, where you have two lists. Um, it's hard to do this. I'm not sure do um, Where I have one list, which are the keys, and the other list is the value. And what zip does it takes first takes the first one from the first list and the first one from the second list. And the second one from the first list, the second one from the second list. So as long as you the same number in the first one and the second one, it will pair them up, make those key value pairs, like in the example above, and then create a dictionary that way. Um, if you already have a dictionary, you can create another dictionary from it, um, or just assign it like that. But none of them are what I have. All I have, again, are just the values. I don't have the keys. Where am I supposed to get the keys from? Um, so, finally, I just said, well, let me just try running a dict. I don't even know why I thought to do this, probably because my, my coworker said, try it. And I didn't know what he meant. He wasn't in the office that day. So, I tried it. And I got a dictionary back. Like, what, what the hell, right? Like, how, like, what's going on here? Um, does anyone know what's going on here? It's like, have you ever tried to do this? Do you know you can do this and see why? Is everyone's kind of shaking their heads or like, do you know this or I don't like I didn't know you could do this. It's, I don't think it's documented. I looked and I couldn't find it. Um, so then I said, well let's let's see what type. So Python you can do introspection. You can ask what type of particular variable it is. So that's what I'm doing there. And when you do this, it turns out that they're not tuples. They are instances of SQL Alchemy Engine resolve that row proxy. Like, hmm. Uh, so what this really, what these really are, they're not tuples. They are these row proxies that are pretending to be tuples. And like, how are they doing that? Um, well, the way they're doing this are through thunder, thunder functions, or special methods. So I got these things called special, well, they have a number of different names. Um, well, we'll talk about what it means in a second. But I mean, we've all seen a knit. Like, if you've done any Python programming at all, like, this is the way you, you initialize a class, is with underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. They all start with two underscores, and they end with two underscores. Um, so there's str, which is the way you can take a, an object and turn it into a string. Um, most languages that do object orientation, object oriented, or that are object oriented, have one method to do that. Um, Java has two string. It says a pipe that has two, they have, oh, I don't know what I Iter. Iter is a way to kind of uh, iterate through an object while the examples for this later on. Um, next is another one in doing that. So those are like the, maybe like the ones you may have seen the most. But there's a dozens and dozens of these. Um, and they are, um, first of all, you would never call these yourself. They're generally like kind of callback functions, that callback methods that Python itself will end up calling, just like init, you never call init yourself, except if you're trying to call it super, a super class in this method. Um, and they're really the key to writing, um, not just like idiomatic Python, but Python code that works like the internal Python classes in those. Um, so what to call them, they have a number of different names. Um, the documentation calls them special method names. Um, we'll also see magic methods or double underscore methods, but double underscore methods is kind of a mouthful, so people tend to abbreviate that to just being dunder methods. Um, and so what are they? So they're kind of like interfaces in Java or roles in Moose. Moose is a, um, a uh, a package in Perl that kind of lets you create objects in the way you can in real language that has real objects in them. Um, except that they're kind of loosely coupled. You don't have to declare all of them. They're just defaults if you don't want really to use them. Um, they're also kind of a bit like virtual methods. Um, so how do, how do they work? So let's take a simple example. Um, here, here's a name class. and. Um, it has two parameters, um, a first name and a last name. Uh, so if you say name lowercase equals name uppercase and you pass in Bruce and Wayne, it will assign first the first one to self.first and the last one to self.last. All right, 
And then, um, okay, so that's simple thing. So let's say if you want to print out, let's say we're going to print out name that first, name that second, and then the whole name. We do that. We get Bruce for the first name, we get Wayne for the second one, but we get this ugly thing with object and some hex string afterwards. That's because what it's really trying to print out is like an inter it's like the internal representation of the object, which you normally don't want. Um, so if you declare a special method called str, that's going to be how you want the string to really appear when, when if you want to turn it into a string in a nice clean way, you can do that. I'm using these f methods, which I talked this at these f strings, which I talked about earlier, which the teacher I think they added them in maybe Python 3.5 or 3.6, 3.5. Okay, so I was using 3.4 earlier today. Um, so all that I do there is just take a string. So basically anything inside the curly braces gets eaten down before it comes out if, you're, if you start the string with an f. Uh, so it's pretty straight. You can kind of figure out what it's going to do. And that's just basically kind of make a string with the first name, a space, and then the second name. And now when we go to print out name, we get Bruce Wayne. Just like this. Um, so as I was saying before, most, like, most object-oriented languages only have one way to do that. Python has two. They have str and they have repr, which I think is short for representation. Um, so the difference is that str is what happens when you try to print it out. You try to turn it into a string, just printing it out. And repr is what happens if you try to evaluate it in the REPL. So you're using Python interactively. Um, the, there's no rules for what you want to do, but typically the convention is that str is a more human-friendly string, and the repr is a more internal representation of it. So you can see like how you would call it if you wanted to generate the object. So that's what I'm doing here. You'll see when I print it out that um, here, instead of just saying Bruce and then Wayne, I'm saying first equals Bruce and last equals Wayne. Uh, and you can also see that if here I'm, I'm doing the same thing I'm trying to print out, but because I don't have an str method, it's going to fall back to the repr method. If I had both of them, it would use str. Um, Okay, so at this point, that's mostly the end of my prepared slides. I have a bunch of examples that I'll go over. <coughs> I'll go into this in the yeah. so. So how um, Is that, is that too dark? Can you read the colors? Yeah. Okay. 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 So, um, okay. So, here this is showing some other some other things you can do. So, here internally I, I have an object. I'm going to make an object that pretends to be an array. So we're going to work our way up to what to what the Roblox was doing. Um, so here we have, we're going to make an object, a, a class that is going to pretend to be an array. So we're going to initialize it to an array, um, with some, you know, some array of numbers. Um, the two things that are most important here are the len and really get like a, so len, it gets called, if you say len for the, for that, it's going to return the length of it. So here we'll just return the length of the, the string, A. Um, get item. It's going to ask for one of the items in here, and we want to return that item. So when we ask for the ith item, we want to return the ith item. And again, because we have an array, we can just return it directly from there. Um, and then I added an str and an rpr, which are like basically the same thing. So,
So now we have an FA object, right? If I just type it here, why did it do that? You need parentheses. Oh, great. So now if we print it out, we do that. But we could treat this as as an array, really. So we could say FA sub sub zero and get the first one. We can say FA sub minus one and get the last one. We can do a slice. Two, four. We can say sorted FA. Sorted. And do that. And we can do all of this. And really, all we really had to implement were these top two functions, the len and the get item. Um, this is pretty cool, right? And we could do, um, we're getting all those things. We're getting slices, and we, we're getting, we can we can also say for x in fa x. We can print all that. We can iterate over what we have, too. All really from just implementing a couple of little functions. This is really cool, right? Yes? Is that because the like sorted and the for loop rely on like get item internally? Or is there something like, how does it know yes. it's treated? Um, like how does it know that it's in a, how does it know okay, to treat so it like an array? That's a good question. So let's, and that's really all that it's asking for. So let's just say, under iter and because Walt didn't define under iter it's right. inheriting the list object well it's not because it doesn't know that it's a list right because it doesn't necessarily know that it's a, you, you can define I have some examples of that later on but okay let's assume what, it, what, it, what it's doing and which of these is getting called doing is calling get item. And I guess when it hits the end, it throws an exception and it's trapping the exception and then it's stopping. Cool. Right, there's only five, it should only go up to five. Right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, if we say then FA then all the way. So you get a lot of stuff for free just by just by really implementing get item. Okay, so here what I'm doing is I'm initializing, I'm giving it a dictionary, right? A simple dictionary kind of a trimmed down version of what I have in the database. Um, and your get item, we'll see why I'm looking at these two different things. But here, if it just gets called with a number, so if it gets called with, with the key, then it'll return that value. So if that if the thing is in the dictionary, it will return that that the value associated with it. Otherwise, it's going to assume that it's getting called as an integer. And if you say list on a dictionary, you get a list of the keys. And then other then I'm going to return that as a tuple along with the associated value. So the cake key is this, and the cake value is that. And I'm going to return it as a tuple because I wanted to pretend how that row proxy was working. Um, 
Um, yeah. So and then this is just sort of Kirk is is just iterating over over all the things in there and doing that, and then it runs it out. So let's just see. It called it with 0, 1, and 2, which is how many things were in there. And it just turned it into that. And then for the second time, I, I want to turn it into a dict. And it could turn it into a dict because of what I was returning were key value pairs. It could take the key and the value and put those together into a dictionary. OK? Um, but it turns out that if you have a keys method, not a dunder keys method, because dunder keys is something else. Dunder keys is the list of all the methods and variables associated with the class. And it's like a, it's a, it's, it's not a method, it's a, it's a list of things. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't think this is documented either, but if all I'm doing is commenting this out, then they'll get, I can print like this. when I turned it into a dictionary. It was only going off of the tuples, and it could convert the dictionary into tuples that way. It, it could turn the tuples into a dictionary because it took the tuples. But when I uncommented, when I uncommented keys, then it called keys. It got the list of all the, key, the keys that are in there, so dog, ant, and spider. And then when it called, then it called get item for each of the keys and they got the corresponding value that way. So, so here it was calling get item with the numbers up here when I call it that way. But here it was calling it with the, with the strings. And it's sort of magic. I don't think that that's documented anywhere. I had to trace through the, the SQL output to find that. Because I didn't know how to do it. I found like all these other ways you could do it. I assumed it was doing something with tuples because obviously it, it has. It knows what you're selecting because it's in the SQL state and had to, had to know what those are. Um, so, so this was my attempt at making a fake row proxy. Like it having, having something work more like how they work. So um, here, my row proxy it takes a um, so these are the column names, and these are the key value pairs associated with them. So every one of these was one of the rows that it passed in, and these are the, the column names that are getting. Um, no, that I'm, say, I'm saying that my favorite word proxy is like stashing away somewhere. Um, so I'm going to make a, an array of fake row proxies. And I'm passing the same columns each time and then the vowels for those pair of values from these two bowls here. And what, I'm do, what I do with them here is I take the keys, which were name and length. And I take the values, which are the tuple, and then I make a dictionary out of them by zipping them up, like I showed you before. Um, so stirring up are pretty straightforward. The keys just returns the keys, and then this works the way it did before. So then when I print it out, I'm going to print out the dictionary, and I'm going to print out the raw. So I'm going to print out the the row set itself, and I think through this I'm going to get tuples because I'm just printing, I'm just going to return the string of the values, and the values were tuples. So when I go to print it out, I'll just get a list of tuples. But when I call dictionary on it, it will pull up keys and turn it into um, a dictionary that way. So for every one of the rows, I'll print out the dictionary and I'll print out the, the raw value, and then I'll turn.
this was this is what I would get out if I'm just printing out the so this is my fake row proxy, right? So this is what I got back from it. And that corresponds to this line up here. And then for each of them, this is the dictionary that was associated with it I created in the constructor. Um, this is the tuple, the dog and how many legs it has. And here is when I join them up to make the dictionary. And it's not a lot of code, but this is like what's going on more or less. It's a much simplified version of what's going on behind the scenes of SQL Alchemy to create that. So make sense? Do you have any questions? I know I'm not kind of covering a lot of stuff here. All right. Otherwise, I'm going to go on. So some other examples. So, um, another interesting Thunder function is call. And so call um, lets you pretend, so just like get item lets you pretend that your class is a list or something that's iterable, um, call lets you pretend that your class is a function and lets you call, call it. Um, so, what we're doing here is so I call it dn because it's making a dice, a die with n sides on it. Um, so when you initialize it, it sets n to be that. And then every time you call it, it gives you a random integer between 1 and that number. Um, so I'm gonna, here I'm making a d6, and then I want to call it 10 times. And then every time I'm going to print i and then just the result of that. And it's like rolling a die, right? That's pretty cool. I think like lots of times people wouldn't do it this way though. I think that doing this has kind of gone out of favor because I think generally people would write it as an iterator. So I'll show you how to do that. So I made another version of this as an iterator. Um, so this is um, a bit more involved. So here I'm passing in both the, the, the value, like how many sides it's going to have, and how many times I want to call it, because you have to be able to terminate the iterator somehow. Or it might go, but otherwise it'll just run off forever. Um, so we have to instantiate two methods then. So it's, we don't have the dunder call anymore, we have two of them. We have dunder iter, which is basically saying that I want to treat this, this um, class as an iterator. And it just could return itself. There's some more complex thing where you could return something else, but the simple example is just going to do that. And then Dunder next just says every time I want to create a new value for this, get to get the next value of this, it's going to call Dunder next and it's going to return whatever the next value is. So here, um, well, it's going to keep track of how many times it's been called, and then it's just going to return another random integer between 1 and n. Um, when it's been called times times, so I'm passing in 10 down here. When it's been called 10 times, the way you stop it from iterating is you raise the stop iteration signal or, or uh, exception, and then it will stop. Right. Um, so all I'm doing here is I'm making a d6 that I can call 10 times, and then I'm going to iterate over that, and I'm going to print it out x. Hopefully, it'll be 10 times. And there we go. No one following that? Um, let's see. I think I have an example of the Fibonacci numbers that you get to. So I think what this does is it prints out the first. Um, Hundred Fibonacci numbers, and then it stops when it gets to that. So I just kind of hardwire those in. Um, so 
Oh, I think I stopped when I got it at a Fibonacci number greater than 100. Yeah. So, right. So I already iterated the two once, and I had to read it. because you don't, iterators are nice also because you don't have to generate the entire list up front, which could potentially be really long. You get, there's iterators for the combinatorics things where it could have millions of things that it's going to generate, but because you can just do it one at a time, you don't have to generate the whole list. So here, if you could not you know, just doing it one at a time, then you could get very big. Um, so I think this is like pretty much all the examples that I had. Um, so if you want to have any questions, I have more questions. Maybe I shouldn't have had that caveat slide. Mm -hmm. yeah. have more questions. Um, so, have people used these before? I don't know how much of this is new or review or, or what. I've used the iterator ones, not the dictionary ones. Have you used yield? Yeah, yeah. generators too. Generators? Is there anyone who used yield? You know how those work? Anyone want me to show you how to use yield? Sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah, have you seen it or not? I know I'll do it if you know how they work. But okay, let's do a yield inside of closure. Yeah, so basically the difference is that get item lets your class pretend to be iterable, like can pretend to be a list, but um, yield lets your function work the same way. Um, that's kind of a high level, but let's. So let's I don't know, let's have it print out like even numbers less than ten. Ooh. <laughs> What's that at the end of the? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, was writing, like, I said I was writing C plus plus for for the academic code problems and I kept leaving the the C, the, the the, the semicolons off of my print statements. <laughs> print statements right now I'm, I'm adding them. Sure. Um, so So yield is like, okay, let's just run it and see if that actually works. Yes, how about that? So first try. Yeah. So 
The way this works is that yield is like return, except that it doesn't, the function keeps running. And it just, it returns that value, but it keeps, it keeps running at the same time. When the function, when the function exits, that's a signal that there's nothing else left in that generator anymore. So, so obviously like this is, this even every time it prints it out, this Y function is still running because it's gonna generate the next one after that as well. So it takes a little bit of sort of wrapping your head around it, but essentially it lets you iterate over the results of a function just as you would iterate over the things that are ranked. And things that are integral in Python like turn up all the time, like being able to say for X, for X and Y, like do something is something that's really useful. Yeah. Would it do the same thing if you just did print Y and call Y a bunch of times? Would it do the same thing? I think not. I think you have to say, um, well, let's try it. Um, is kind of print out something internal. Yeah. Um, I think what you have to say is why not next? Maybe. No. Okay. Thunder next. Thunder. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, no. I, we have to say I know. Next. I think I think next calls dunder next on the item. Oh, because it's it's reinitializing every time. Um, Would you mind trying to call dunder next on uh, one of the Y friends? I'm not sure if it'll work. I don't think it will. I don't think it will because there's no. It's not even in class. I mean, I, I, what, what should this text be? Uh, 